Hey, it's Robert Manny, host of Guys Guys Radio, and what better place to announce our podcast drop of our brand new show featuring actor Vincent Pastor, Big Pussy from The Sopranos, and he's a wonderful guy, and it's a wild, crazy interview I had with him on Guys Guys Radio. The podcast drops Thursday morning all over the internet, iHeartRadio, Spotify, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, CastBox, Google Podcasts. You can stream it on KCAA.com or RobertManny.com. As you know, the show also broadcasts every Wednesday evening and Sunday afternoon on KCAA Radio in Los Angeles area, Southern California, 102.3, 106.5 FM, 1050 AM. Guys, Guys Radio, Robert Manny. Thanks. It's Guy's Guy Radio. Here's your host, Robert Manny. All right, welcome to Guy's Guy's Radio. This is your host, Robert Manny, welcoming you to the show where men and women can be their best and everyone wins Guy's Guy's Radio. Hey, you know, we're approaching our 400th show. It's amazing. We've done a year or so on KCAA, and before that, we just did the podcast. Now we have both. And it's been an amazing ride, and we just continue to grow and grow and grow. And over that time, what I have made my job to do to serve is to really bring guests on the show that you can learn something from and be entertained by. So I have interviewed writers, relationship experts, healers, teachers, doctors, comedians, musicians, attorneys, advocates, all kinds of folks I've been on Guys Guys Radio, but I have never, until today, interviewed a soprano. So today we've got a very, very special show. Our special guest is Vincent Pastor, best known as Salvador, from his role as, as of Salvador, Big Pussy Bonaspiero on The Sopranos. And what's amazing about it is that he, Vincent was only on the show for two years, but he made such an impression that... Everybody thinks of him as a core character. Everybody loves his character. And throughout the, the remainder of the show, in subsequent seasons, somehow his spirit, if you will, kept showing up, whether it be in Fish that Tony Soprano would be interacting with or in the cat that was uh, spooking uh, Paulie Walnuts. It's just an amazing. And you know what? It's really why Vincent Pastor is such a special talent. He has a gift. This is what I I learned a lot by interviewing him, and I want to thank him for that. And it wasn't an easy job to interview him because he keeps you on your toes, and he likes to, as he says, bust chops. And he busted my chops, but it was fun. And by the end of the interview, as you will see, we were high-fiving, and it was a really great time that we have, and the plan is to do it again. So let me tell you a little bit about Vincent um, and kind of where we took this interview and how it got started. You know, at the beginning of this year, I put together a list. I said, these are the folks I want to interview this year, and I wrote out 50 names. I started at number one. It was Vincent Pastor. I went on social media. I saw that he has a new line of sauce. I'm like, great. I love tomato sauce. My, I'm, a, I'm an Italian-American, and it sounds like a great idea. And who else would be more authentic than, than uh, Vincent? So I tracked down his social media guy, I think, uh, his, that's what his job is, but I went through social media and I was connected to his management and uh, then they connected me directly to Vincent and it's amazing, it just bang, 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 it happened and that's very refreshing and that's really cool and it taught me something that, you know, ask and you shall receive, but you better be prepared. So I made sure that I prepared for the interview and it was a pre-recorded interview uh, that we did last week, and it was a real roller coaster. It was a lot of fun. I learned a lot uh, from Vincent and about entertainment, if you will, and authenticity, and I also learned what a great talent he is. As I was saying earlier, he has a gift for making things happen, 
And what I mean by that, if you've ever seen him, whether it be acting, writing, music, stage, screen, TV, whether it's scripted or non-scripted reality shows, he always leaves a lasting impression. On The Sopranos, he was only on two seasons. Everybody remembers him, and he was there in spirit throughout the next five years, I believe. On Shark Tank, he had a wild ride there where he had a product that, uh, that uh, they asked him to put his uh, face on the product packaging, and he agreed. But it was, it was a situation, if you will. He also was on Celebrity Apprentice with uh, President Trump, and it was also a wild roller coaster ride. My point being, anytime Vincent gets involved in something in the entertainment business, he makes things happen. And he's, he is a studied stage actor, uh, writer. Uh, he, he studied at HB. He teaches acting. He's a playwright. He's just an amazing guy. And uh, I, I really learned a lot, and I really had a lot of fun. He started uh, uh, in Broadway, on Bullets Over Broadway, the musical, and then he was in Chicago, and uh, he's got a band now, the Gangster Squad. He's just done so much. We'll get into his uh, real introduction when I bring him on. Uh, but it was interesting because I did not get his bio in time for the interview, and so I went on w- Wikipedia, and Vincent was very clear about correcting me every time <laughs> I had information that wasn't exactly right, including some little things like... I. I mentioned he was a Yankees fan, and he's like, no, I don't like baseball. So it was a very direct conversation, and I'm, I'm very uh, honored that, that Vincent uh, graced Guys Guys Radio. And I think you're going to have a blast with this interview. Let me tell you a little bit more about um, how this happened and how we did it. I had other challenges when I do interviews with people online. A lot of times I want to use Skype or Zoom. And then some guests say, no, call me up on the phone. And that was kind of the case here. So I had to figure out a way. How do I get a good recording uh, of the interview? Uh, We managed to figure it out. And it worked. So the, the point is, you make things happen. You adjust. If you have goals, you're going to have some obstacles on the way. You just stick with it and you go through it and you make it happen. I want to talk about his sauce real quick before we start the interview with him because I don't think we gave it, I think Vincent was kind of goofing on me when we talked about the sauce a little bit, to be honest with you, but it's really good stuff. It's called Vincent Pastore's Italian Sauce, Uh, a newer shell, third generation Italian, and he always wanted to create a delicious sauce to enjoy with friends and family. So it's Vincent Pastore's Italian Sauce. This one is a marinara sauce. It's made with San Marzano sugar added, non-GMO, and it's fantastic. And it's a sauce. It's not a gravy, as Vincent would say. So we're going to get into that and much, much more on Guys Guys Radio. So interesting about my talk with Vincent is that be on my game. And I made sure I prepared a lot of questions and he didn't have a lot of time. But we managed, actually, we managed to get through every, every section that I wanted to cover and we had enough time. And he's just an amazing. He had he threw me off guard. So many different answers. He caught me off guard. And it was he had some exclusives in there that you'll hear that are hilarious and also from the heart. And he's a really good guy. And he did bust my chops during the interview, but that's okay. I loved it. It's like, you know, if you're in the audience with Don Rickles there and he makes fun of you, it's great. It's great. And it's and it's an honor. So the other thing I was going to talk about is, uh, and it's, it has to do with, with Vincent being on the show, is that I have a new segment on Guys Guys Radio uh, called Brushes with Fame. And as just a regular guy on a spiritual quest, if you, if you will, uh, leading a regular life, I'm a guy's guy, and I've had some brushes with fame in my career in advertising in New York and elsewhere. And I I realized once I moved to San Diego, like, hey, I'm not going to run into a lot of these people in the same way. But they've been some fun ones. So it's interesting that I've actually met two other Sopranos uh, during my time in New York. The first was, uh, and I mentioned this in the the interview, that I met James Gandolfini uh, one afternoon at a uh, pub in the meatpacking district. I had, (laughs) believe it or not, Unfortunately, I had just lost a job through a reorganization, and uh, 
Nowadays, if something like that happened, I'd go out for a run. But then I walked over and I said, I've got to sit down and have a beer. And I'm sitting there and it's in the afternoon, about three o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, this was after season one of The Sopranos and James Gandolfini, he stopped by and sat two stools away from me. And so it's just he and I. So I said, hey, uh, and The Sopranos hadn't really taken off yet. And I said, hey, I, I, lo- I love your work. I really like the show. How's it going? And he and I, we just talked and had a couple of beers for an, an hour. And he was, he was very authentic. You could tell that uh, in, deep down there was a part that uh, he knew how to tap into to develop the character of Tony Soprano. Uh, he knew how to pull that out of him. He wasn't like Tony Soprano by any means. And he didn't speak like Tony Soprano. But you could feel, being in his presence, that he had the capacity to draw on an aspect of himself. And that means he was just a tremendously talented, gifted actor. He also uh, had lived in uh, Park Ridge, New Jersey, which was right next door to where I had lived for a number of years in Woodcliffe Lake, New Jersey. And uh, he was also, uh, he had worked as a bouncer at Private Eyes, I believe he told me which is one of the clubs back in the 80s when I first moved into Manhattan. They used to go to places like that. And who knows, he might have he carded me. So, uh, so he was a terrific guy. The second brush with fame, if you will, with a soprano was I met Michael Imperioli. We were uh, looking for, I was in advertising, and we were looking to reposition the product 1800 Tequila. And we needed a personality who uh, really demonstrated and portrayed kind of the new kind of guy who's like no nonsense guy. And so we looked at all these different people. We just went through the list and uh, the list kept getting longer and longer. And I said, how about Michael Imperioli? This was right when The Sopranos was just finishing up. And we agreed to him. And uh, with my client, we had a contract set out and we got him signed. And he showed up when we were doing the uh, kind of pre-pro, what you call pre-production meeting. And he was such a nice, cool guy, yet incredibly professional. So he walks into the pre-production meeting. He's got an army jacket on. His hair's a little long. He says, hi, hi. We all introduce ourselves. ourselves. I was, my name was Bob when I was in advertising. Bob Manning instead of Robert Manning. People used to call me Bob, and that's cool. A lot of my friends do. Just like De Niro, right? So anyhow, uh, I introduced myself. And uh, so we asked Michael, here's some suits. When you need to wear a suit for this ad, and he just walked over. It's a big rack of suits. And he walks over. He takes one. He told us our size, so they're all in his size. He takes one. He says, how about this? Yeah, fine. Walks over, takes a pair of shoes in his size. And then he said, do you want me to get a haircut? And I think we had to, we had to get his, uh, his haircutting stylist into New York to do his hair. But we pulled it together. And the next week, we did the shoot. He was a total professional. He would, when the, when our, we had a really good director. And it was for 1800 tequila. You might remember those ads. Hey, what happened to tequila? And he knocks over the bottle of uh, Patron and he kicks it off the table by accident. And it really jump started the, the uh, renaissance, if you will, the resurrection of the tequila brand 1800 tequila, which had been mortibund for a number of years. Well, anyhow, Michael was so talented and easy to work with that. To, I remember the director saying, Give me 10% more of that on a take. And you could literally see and feel that he, would, he just nailed it. He could actually dial it up. He was that much of a professional, and he was really good. And between takes, he was sitting there, I remember reading the New York Post, and then when it was t- showtime, he would take the direction. And like a lot of really great actors, he really wanted to be directed very specifically and clearly. And at the end, I suggested to the director, I said, why don't you let Michael do one, do a take the way he wants to do it. And it was suggested to him, and he he shook his head. No, he didn't want to do that. It was like, you tell me what to do. It's your brand. And that's how I do it. So the other cool thing about him was when he came into the shoot, which was like a, like a week later after our pre-production meeting, he walked by me and said, hi, Bob. He actually remembered my name from meeting a group of like six people a week ago who he had never met. And I thought that was terrific and very impressive. So he's a really cool guy. I hope to get him on Guys Guys Radio. Maybe Vincent and his people can help me out. But those were my two brushes with fame with Sopranos prior to our very, this isn't a brush with fame, this is an interview with Vincent Pastor on Guys Guys Radio. And I got to tell you, as you're going to see when we have our interview, uh, it was fun. It's a roller coaster ride. 
by the end of the interview, you're going to see that what a blast we had and how, how Vincent has this special gift that he demonstrates in our interview to make things happen. Uh, it's just, it's an, it's an amazing talent and he's an amazing, talented, very smart guy and he's an entertainer. He's just terrific. And I, I, I'm so glad that um, he, at the end, actually considers me, uh, quote unquote, a friend, even though we don't know each other too much. Uh, hopefully we will in the future and hopefully we'll be able to do it again. So Guys Guys Radio, our very, very special show with a very, very special guest, Vincent Pastor. Thanks so much for being here and we're going to get it on right now. All right, our special guest today on Guys Guys Radio is a really special guy. His name is Vincent Pastor, and he's an Italian-American actor best known for his portrayal of Salvatore Big Pussy Bon Pensiero on the HBO series The Sopranos. But what really blew me away about Vincent is the breadth of his work since beginning his acting career in his 40s. He's been working constantly over what I counted over 60 films and TV credits, everything from Carlito's Way, Goodfellas, Gotti, The Jerky Boys, and he's truly a Renaissance man. He's a playwright. He's a producer, TV, film, Broadway, reality, TV star. He's been in soaps. He's a musician. He's got a band called the Gangster Squad. And he's also a teacher at HP, I believe. And he's an entrepreneur who recently launched the Vinnie Pastor's line of tomato sauces. So you can see that there's a lot more to Vincent Pastor than you may glean from his iconic role on The Sopranos, which people forget was only for two seasons, yet his presence is timeless on that show. So welcome to Guys Guys Radio, Vincent Pastor. Thanks so much for being here. You're welcome. Okay. All right. We're going to get into your role on The Sopranos, your deep experience in show business, of course, the new line of sauces. But let's start just real quick at the beginning, and then we'll move very quickly from there. Okay. You were born in New Rochelle, uh, New York. You graduated high school. You were in the U.S. Navy and attended Pace University. And like fellow Sopranos cast member James Gandolfini, you worked in the club business for many years. So what drew you to acting? Uh, I always was uh, studied acting. I, I studied acting in high school and college, but I didn't uh, go after acting professionally until uh, 1989. Now, were the Dillon brothers uh, friends of yours, and did they encourage you to get into the business? Yes. Okay. Um, so you did take a lot of classes. Where did you study? At HB Studios, where I teach now. Okay. What do you think, uh, Vincent, makes for an effective actor? To learn your lines. Okay. And wh what, do you, what makes a successful working actor? To find out uh, what you're made of, and this way when you learn your lines, you can uh, develop your character. But all the characters come from who you are. Okay. Now, when you uh, finally had your breakthrough part in uh, The Sopranos, how, did you have to audition for the role? And I'm sorry, uh, really sorry. That was not my breakthrough role. Okay. My breakthrough role was the role on John Gotti with Armand Asante, where I played Angela Ruggiero, and because of that, I was able to get on the HBO Sopranos. So my breakthrough role was an HBO film with Armand Asante called Gotti. Okay. And uh, when you got the role of uh, Big Pussy, was that a role that had been already developed by uh, David Chase, or was that something written in because he really liked your work? How, how did that come about? You audition. Everybody auditioned for specific roles, and I auditioned for that. Okay. Um, you were only on, you know, you were in the show for like two years, yet your core character really lived forever in the show, whether it was through the fish or the, the cat that haunted, uh, that haunted Paulie Wallace. What do you think is about, what was about this character that was so important and made such an impression in our, in our culture, really? Well, it was good television. Okay. Um, I had heard that there was no improvising on the uh, set of uh, The Sopranos and working with David Chase. Is that true? And does that, if that's the case, does that make your job as an actor easier and more predictable because you know the actors you aren't going to like go off and do something that you're playing off of? No. Well, listen, when you're doing a play, you have to stick to the script, whether it's written by Tennessee Williams or, or, or David Mamet. 
when you're doing a, a, a movie, uh, sometimes there's some leeway, depending on the director and the writer. But even recently, I just did a film called uh, Birthday Cake, and they don't want you to improvise. They, they This guy sat down, he wrote my character um, that I played, and and you have to go up there and you got to nail it. you got to nail the lines. Otherwise, they say cut and you go back to one. Mm-hmm. So improvisation uh, is uh, it's it's a good acting exercise, but I don't think there's ever been one movie ever made without a script. Improvisation is good for the beginning of the scene and after, and sometimes they cut it. But uh, nobody uh, can make up improvisation and try to continue through the film because, first of all, they don't remember what they said, and the script supervisor doesn't remember what you said. So all that stuff is out of the window. Uh, mm-hmm. I know when I worked uh, some some directors, you rehearse, you improvise, and then you lock it in, and then you don't improvise anymore. Is it tough to redo a scene and come back, come come again with that same emotion? Especially no, if you think you've nailed it. Oh, you not if you know your lines and you know who the character is. You just do another take. Okay. Now, James uh, Gandolfini was very authentic and original. I actually, um, a quick story, I met him in a bar called the Gas Lamp, I think, or the Gas Light in the, the Meatpacking District. I had, I was in a job, an advertising job, and uh, we got reorganized, and I was out, and I went, I stopped at that place, and James actually came in. This was after season one of The Sopranos, and he sat one stool away from me, and then it was just us in the place, and so we started talking, and I mentioned the work and everything, and uh he comes from uh, Park Ridge. He was telling me he had lived there, and I had lived in Woodcliffe Lake. And uh, he was a really authentic guy, and he was very friendly, and, but he was real, and he had a commanding presence. What was it that uh, – why did you really click with him? Because it seems like that you guys had a real chemistry, and I could t- it seemed to me like you guys were friends in real life. Is that true? Yeah, we were friends in real life. What, what was he like? Is, was my uh, what I'm saying accurate about his authenticity? He seemed like the same guy that uh, you know that I, I watched on the screen. Now, of course, he didn't have the same voice, that's, intentions, and all that. But that's not true because Jimmy was as far as you could be from a wise guy. He was a regular guy, and actually, when he was walking down the street, if you called out the name Tony Soprano, he got very upset. He was an actor, and he was playing a character on the show of. Um, Tony Soprano, the same way everybody else were playing characters. Uh, uh, Michael Imperioli um, as Christopher. I mean, if you called Mm -hmm. out Christopher to Michael walking on the street, he won't turn around. I mean, I acknowledge when people call me Big Pussy and everything because it's kind of like the name stuck with me, but it's not my professional name, and that's not how the checks are signed. Nobody signs a check to Big Pussy. They sign the Big (laughs) That's That's very true. Uh, I guess... especially. When you're trying to uh, go on with your life and do roles that are not like that character, mm-hmm. you have to, you know, it's, it, it, it helps you and it hurts you. It helps you because you became an icon, but it hurts you because a lot of producers and directors say, oh, that's big pussy. Mm-hmm. No, I can totally so understand that. Mm-hmm. I guess what I meant, I misspoke about uh, James Gandolfini, was he was just seemed very, he had a great presence. He was very authentic, and he was a nice guy. And he, of course, he didn't speak like Tony Soprano or anything. And I, I wasn't thinking this is Tony Soprano. And the, the series had was just taking off after after season one. But it was fascinating to meet with him. He bought me a drink. He was really good guy. That's really what my point was. Okay. Um, yeah, great guy. The cast of The Sopranos seemed like they had so much chemistry, and uh, it was, seemed like there was a lot of give and take, and very supportive. How did you keep that going, and was that true? Did you guys really like each other the way it seemed to come across to everyone? Yeah, we liked each other. Do you guys still t- stay in touch or beyond? You know, I know you have the Sopranos Con that, that was recently, but uh, and I, I saw a big I'm interview. Cool. Well, the Soprano Con was, uh, was great, uh, but I have a show called Conversations with the Sopranos. It's with Michael Imperioli and Steve Sharippa, and uh, we go on tour all over the world. We did Australia, and now we're going to Great Britain, and it's a, it's a show. It's- what do you think made that show so unique and that everybody, regardless of you know where they're from in the United States and even worldwide, that they could identify with it? Was it family? Was it chemistry? Was it story? Was it the acting? Was it all of the above? Was it the all whole Italian the- thing? All of the above. Mm-hmm. How do you feel? I'm also an Italian-American. How do you feel about, um, uh, do you feel that Italians sometimes get typecast? 
I get typecast. I don't know about everybody else. John <laughs> Ford doesn't get typecast. Right. I don't get typecast. Even De Niro, but I get typecast. Okay. <laughs> Now, you had a lot of work you did in reality TV. I was just, I was reading some of your bio online and I was like, my God, Celebrity Fit Club, Dancing with the Stars, Celebrity Apprentice, Celebrity Family Feud, Shark Tank, World's Smartest uh, Inventions, Famous Food, and I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Vincent, you're going to be on Gordon Ramsay's 24 Hours to Hell and Back? Yeah, that was already on. It was on last night. Okay. Um, what was it like? I guess the obvious question is, I know you're, you're, uh, your role in Celebrity Apprentice was was a classic because you switched sides uh, to the other team. You went over to the ladies' team. You came back, and then then you left the show. What, what was it like? The experience of Celebrity Apprentice, and of course, the obvious question: What was what was Donald Trump like to work with? Uh, I really don't talk too much uh, politics. That's, I'm one of the actors who don't even. As far as my relationship with Donald Trump, all I could say is. He hired me at a time when I wasn't working. Mm-hmm. He helped me raise $50,000 from my ex-wife's foundation, the Lust Garden Foundation, because her husband died from pancreatic cancer, my daughter's stepfather. And we have been, we have remained friends. As far as, uh, is he doing a good job as a president and all this stuff about the impeachment, I really don't want to go down that road. No, sure. No, of course. But, how, but working with him, was it fun? Yeah, a lot of fun. Donald was a lot of fun. Okay. Um, now, you had a, also a pretty iconic uh, stint on Shark Tank where you had your product, the Broccoli Wad, and I think Barbara Corcoran uh, got involved with that, and she wanted to put your your uh, likeness on the packaging, and you agreed to the deal. Is that is that true? Yeah, but as soon as we walked outside, the guy who created the, uh, who invented the product said, we're not going to sign that deal. I said, you already did. He said, I just wanted to be on TV. So that's the way it's wow. going. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, this gets us co- towards like uh, food. So you were on, I think, Famous Food, where people set up a restaurant on the Sunset Strip. You're on Gordon Ramsay's show. What is your uh, affinity to food and food products, and how did that translate into launching your line of tomato sauces? Well, I don't think one had anything to do with the other. The fact that I was on um, Gordon Ramsay, I mean, the sauce was out already. And the other show, Famous Foods, that was like um, a competitive thing. It didn't mm-hmm. have any the food. That's, uh, who could set this restaurant up? Right. And um, uh, I was like almost neck and neck to win, but then I had a problem with the girl from, uh, I was going to say Desperate Housewives. It's New Jersey Housewives. I'm not going to say her name because I don't need a lawsuit. But because of um, her, the way she played the game, it was almost mm-hmm. like the way Chris Morgan played the game on The Apprentice. I see through that, and I say, um, okay, I got to the last episode, whatever. I'm not going to win this thing, and I and I and I leave. And I think it's um, kind of dramatic mm-hmm. uh, for the viewers to see me walking off a show. I think they love that. I, I think so too. <laughs> you, uh, always, I also you always put with the stars, you know. You 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 were on Dancing with the Stars for what, like a week or something. Yeah, then I quit it. Okay. Well, ask so, me why. Well, are you saying don't ask you or ask you why? No, I'm saying ask me why. I'll tell you. <laughs> okay. <But> this, <laughs> this is uh, an exclusive here. <laughs> Please tell us, Vince, why did you leave well, Dancing with the, the Stars? The girl they had me dancing was too young. She okay. was from Russia. Uh, I couldn't keep up with her. And I didn't like the song they had me dancing to. And I said, can I dance to a Frankie Valli song? And they said, we can't get the rights. And I picked up the phone, and I called up Frankie, and I said, can I get the rights to Over the Night to Dance with the Stars? And he said, yeah, and I put him on speakerphone. And then I went back to my agent, and I said, we got the rights. They said, no, they want to stay with Aretha Respect, and you can't have another dance partner. And I said, this is a fix. They got me on because I'm a senior citizen, and they don't want me past episode one. So they wow. hired. They uh, I had a conflict with them. I quit the show, and then they got the merry mailman from Cheers, and he got thrown off the first show. So that's the demographics of um, America's. What's it called? Dancing with the Stars. Right, Mark Bennett. But Mark Bennett's a sweetheart. I hang out with Mark. All right, let's move to the sauce then, because we'll go from. Uh uh, reality well, TV to the sauce. The sauce is, and I don't want to be negative because I hope the kids are listening to me, and I love them. 
we came out with this sauce in November, mm-hmm. and here it is, almost February, and it's only in one store. And now, why do you think that is? Did you have? Uh, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I well, don't let's know. talk. Let's talk about the sauce. Let's get some distribution. Good for it. You can so, go to A and S stores in Long Island and buy it, and they just opened up a. Uh, 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 another store in Long Island City, but I would think by now it would be in shop rights and all sure. over the place. Mm-hmm. And I don't understand that. I don't understand why nobody wants my sauce. Well, let's let's talk about it a little bit. Was it what was it? Why? What was your inspiration for for making your own sauce? Was it like Grandma's recipe? It's, you know, it, from it, home or it, what? Is, is is let me talk to you very honestly. The inspiration in anything you do at this time in my life is to make some money. Okay. And that's the inspiration. So you could live your life. So you don't have to work seven days a week anymore. Right. So I thought, and I still think, that the sauce being on a shelf could be a nice little income because I don't have to do nothing no more. People buy the sauce, and I make my commission. Okay? But no, they want me to go to the stores, and they want me to sign jars of sauce, and they want me to do this. That. And then a jar of sauce b- broke at the Soprano Con, and I had to mop it up. I oh, mean, my God. On. So now they get all out of hand here. Just let me sell the sauce. Do you, do you cook at all, uh, Vincent? No, I don't cook. In fact, that's why I got to make my phone call short because okay. I got this hot blonde that she just came in from Reno and she just got divorced and she wants me to take her for seafood and I forgot that we had this interview tonight. Okay, well, real quick. Uh, Somewhere else, but I can't say it on the, on the all phone. All right, a, a couple more questions and we're done. Uh, do no, you no, put- no, no, no. I'm looking at the clock. No, she okay. can wait. I'm sure she waited for other people before. Okay. Um, what else do you have in terms of those products in the pipeline? The tomato sauce? The, 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 the <laughs> sauce don't sell. Hey. Well, we got to have our viewers, uh, our listeners rather, ask for it. So, uh, Vincent, well, I think what we should sauce. do is, um, is uh, tell people how we can get this sauce. Yes. Okay. How can they get it? You get in your car. You go out to Long Island, you go to Merrick Road, you look for A&S store, and you go in and there's like 5,000 jars ready to be sold. <laughs> now, there's another store that just opened up in Long Island City, and there's another um, uh, way to get it. You get it online. Um, they didn't send you this information? No. That's well, okay. maybe that's why I'm not being able to sell the sauce, because I can't even tell you where to get it. Okay. All right, but no, I think if people start asking for it, that's the best way to get it. There's a way you can get it on the internet, and okay. I don't want to go to my desk and come back. To no, 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 that's okay. We'll be, have people Google it. Google listeners, Google, Google it. Google store. it. You can exactly. buy it online. They deliver it to your door. Sometimes I deliver it myself. That's how that <laughs> Um, I go to the store a lot in Long Island. I sit there. I eat the food. They're two good kids. They're really wonderful. Uh, they're having a problem. I think, I, you know what I think it is? What? There's Tell just me. too many, too many things out there to pick from. I mean, yeah. you can get ragu. You can get, um, uh, Rayos. You right. can get Paul Newman's. You can, Daryl Hall even has a sauce. <laughs> oh my so, gosh. you know, uh, Mark Ramon has a sauce. I'm serious. So, unless my, my sauce is in a specific store, like in an Italian neighborhood, like in the Bronx, you know, or down a little Italy, that's where people will probably want to come in. Like, there are areas all over the country, Rochester, Buffalo, Italian neighborhoods with stores. That's Absolutely. where this sauce belongs. Mm-hmm. Because I think if it's in Shop Mart, it's going to be, or what's a Shop and Stop, what's the name of that place? Stop and Shop? shop. A? Mm-hmm. Whatever. If it's right next to, like, a jar of ragu, and I'm going for 10 and they're going for $6, they're going to buy ragu. Mm, not if they have good taste, they'll pick. They'll take yours because you know there's a big difference between the the real right. good ones. Yeah, but how do you know until you taste it? Uh, Which that, means that I really think you got a sample. I from A and S sauce should just give this stuff away until you know people really like it. Mm-hmm. So just give it away. Well, maybe you have. Do you have a signature dish for the sauces, pasta, or in you know, the traditional Italian dishes? Do you have I a signature like, dish that you uh, like? I, I, I like to put it on um, uh, these real thick noodles. Uh, ah, okay. Yeah, like, uh, but then you, that, that's got nothing to do with the sauce. Okay. One, talking, la- one, one last question on the food. It's, Great. It's, it's, no, keep going because I got to sell this sauce. It's called Vinnie Pass sauce, Italian marijuana sauce. Mar- how do you say it? 
marinara. marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best sauce, Italian marijuana sauce. That's the sauce we're going to sell in L.A. Oh, yeah. I bet that's better. Put the, put the, the CBD in it, right? You have the, you have the THC oh, yeah. and the CBD in it. You know what? That'll, that'll happen at some point. That'll happen me. in L.A. Uh, mm-hmm. And there's another sauce that I want to do called Big Pussy's Puttanesca Sauce. Uh, and we may re- we may release that in Italy. Oh, wow. Okay. Fantastic. But what so, I like about the sauce mm-hmm. is that a lot of people that who come and buy the sauce, like we sold a lot of it at SopranoCon, they're not even opening up the jar. They just want me to sign it. They're putting it on the shelf, and they're hoping someday I die, it's going to be worth twice as much. <laughs> oh, just say I think they probably just have a lot of respect for you, and they they don't want to you know lose the sauce. They want the sauce in the jar with your name on it because the value right. is really that's, your name. That's, that, that's that's a gift in itself. I mean, uh, everybody that you know, I have my friend over here today because I'm. Uh, I'm putting my van together again for my tour. I'm going on a tour, and I've got my PA system. We were working on it. And I gave my friend, Timmy, who used to play with Howard Stern's band, Pink Vomit, I gave him two jars of sauce. Mm-hmm. And I said, here. And he says, why are you giving me two? I said, one you're going to eat tonight with your wife, and one you <laughs> keep on your shelf with the rest of life. That's awesome. So let's talk about so your band. People go buy the sauce at A&S at Merrick Road in Long Island. And there's other place in Long Island, too, Long Island City. I forget the name of it. We'll find it. Okay. They, go um, by the source. they shouldn't get one jaw. Absolutely not. They should not. get any jaws. All right. Sounds good. So, so it's been... You understand? Absolutely. Listen, I'm in marketing. I used to work for Nabisco. I worked for a lot of food brands. I understand yeah. exactly what you're saying. you got to sample a product. You got to sample the product. I, I, you know, I, I said to the guys, why can't we go to a nice grocery store? You got a big display, and like you have a little sauce and a little thing and a little macaroni. People come by like the old days and give a little free sample. You remember those yeah. days? Yeah, well, I still do that. Don't put nothing away no more. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, listen. The bottom line is, if you have a really good product and you stand by it and you believe in it. It'll get out there, and we'll, we're putting the word out there right now. So Vincent Pat, like word from it. Okay, how's it different? How is my sauce different? Yeah. Than anybody else's? Yep. It's got my picture on the label. <laughs> but you like it, right? And you're authentic. You're for real. I love it. It's great. It's from my grandmother's recipe. Okay. Now, you've got a band also, uh, Gangster Squad, and I've got here that you're playing two gigs coming up. You've got um, Sunday... February 9th at Bar 360 at Resorts World Casino in Queens. Then well, you're at you uh, that show. That's a great two o'clock show. That's called our Senior Citizen Show. Okay, <laughs> I get it. You know, a lot of people come up like Weinstein on the on the wheelchairs. You know, like the walkers. <laughs> they come in and they sit there and they play the slots. And we do mellow music as opposed to like a night show. We're not going to do like you know we don't do Allman Brothers and stuff in the afternoon. We we'll do Sinatra. We we'll do Dean Martin. A little reggae, you know. So, so what 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 do you, do you sing, or would you play an instrument, yes, or sir, I sing. And one of the things that I don't understand why you didn't give me as my credit is that I done I I've been on Broadway. I did. Times. I mentioned that you. I think I mentioned Broadway as a Broadway yeah. and also a TV star. I think I did. You just didn't name the plays. Okay, well, let's talk about it. Which they were musicals. <laughs> okay, I did not. <laughs> no, and when you asked me where I what was my background in acting. It was musical theater. Musical really? Theater. That's okay. why I'm a phone buster. Don't you get it yet? <laughs> You're doing a great job. I can tell Good you job. <laughs> Listen, you're you're amazing. I have a lot of respect for you're you're very entrepreneurial. You're very intelligent, and you've dipped your hands in a lot of different areas and have succeeded. And you really, you know, you're always noticed every time you're in a role. You you stand out by but, but, but without trying to stand out, and I think okay, it's real crazy. Uh, as an actor, you know what I had to do last month. What? I got offered a part in a movie called Birthday Cake, and it wasn't a big part, but I said I want to do it. Val Kilmer, uh, William Fitchner, Ewan McGregor, Lorraine Bracco. I took the part. About okay. two weeks later, my manager calls me up and he said, "Listen, uh, Val Kilmer." has a problem speaking. He's got throat cancer. I said, I heard that. He says he can't speak well. It's hard to understand him. So what they're doing is they're creating a new character. He talks to you. You understand what he says, and you tell everybody what he says to you. That's awesome. I said, great. I, I love it. 
Mm-hmm. So I went on the set and I worked with my friends uh, from class, Louis Vitulli and, and Armand Medeo. They read my lines. Louis came with me on the set. Uh, I had so much live dialogue. I had 20 pages that I said, I need cue cards because I was nervous. And um, my guy, Louie, was holding up the cue cards. But after the first take, they all looked at me and said, you don't need those cue cards. And it's like a crutch because I thought I did, but I didn't. Mm-hmm. You understand? Yeah. And and the interesting story is you never know what's going to come down the line. You understand? You I never understand. know. Mm-hmm. We didn't know when we did Sopranos that first year that it was going to blow up because they didn't show that stuff until the second year. So we're running around the second year on the set making the second season, and it's blowing up. And by the time it blew up, really, I was already gone. I know. So the fact that here it is 20 years later, and I still run around with Soprano Khan and uh, Michael and Steven, and people still... Uh, uh, watch the show, it's because in today's technology, we can go on demand and watch it right now. Years right. ago, you and I couldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Well, let me ask you this, Vincent. So Big Pussy, what do you think about Big Pussy and your portrayal makes him such an iconic character? Everybody seems to love him and identify him. You're on two seasons, and yet everybody always talks about your character. Of course, and I tell you this in class. If you were sitting in my class tonight, okay. I would say you always have to play the good guy. You gotta make them love you. Even if you're about to put a bullet in somebody's head, you gotta make them love you. Mm-hmm. That's why everybody loved all the work of De Niro. As mean and vicious as he was in Goodfellas and uh, Cape Fear, and there's something about his personality that he puts into his movies that we like him. And that's what you have to do. You have to make these characters likable. Even yeah. the Joker, you know, Joaquin yep. Phoenix. God yep. bless him. He's going to win all kinds of awards. He was a sick MF on the movie, but yep. we loved him. Mm-hmm. And that's what you have to put into the work. So do you think it's a likability or the emotional connection or a combination of both? It's what the actor puts into the role. Like mm-hmm. we talk about the great Gandolfini. Why was Tony Soprano such a lovable person? He was heavy set. He was a killer. He cheated on his wife. He wasn't good to his kids. Why did he kill somebody when he went to visit his daughter's college? Why did the audience love him, love James's character, Tony? Because he played every man. He mm-hmm. played us. Yeah. We all play us. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's, that's how people could relate to us. We're, we're, we're New York actors. When I, when I teach, I say we're street actors. We came from the streets. Tony Sirico, me. So you ask me, what was my influence? Mm-hmm. I grew up in a tough neighborhood, all right? Okay. But I know years later when I was growing up that I would have a Screen Actors Guild uh, Award for Sopranos, that I would have these different awards, that I would be teaching in the school that I started. No, because you don't know where your journey is going to go to. But the most important thing, and I'm going to say this before we close, is that I am a ball breaker, but I love my fans. I love every one of them. They come up at the Soprano Con. There were lines. They come to my rock and roll shows. They come to see us with uh, the conversation. We already sold out Glasgow, me and Michael and Steven. Wow. We sold out every city in Australia. I love my fans. So if you're out there listening, just come to the shows. Come to see us. We want to embrace you. We're getting old. Who knows if we're going to be around much longer. And that's what it's all about. You got to pass it on, brother. You got to pass it on. Okay. Last question. I ask every guest: What have you learned with all your experience, all your world travels, all your Hollywood acting, all your businesses? What is it that you've learned about humanity that you want to share with people? That life is short, and the person that you're looking in the eyes and you're telling them how much you love them today may not be here tomorrow, and that's what life is about. So you better appreciate and love every moment of it, whether you got to smoke hot drink liquor, or just dance in the sun, you got to enjoy your life. Go to Vegas. Go to Reno. Go to Europe. <laughs> I so love let me, it. You know, let me tell you something, all right? Then we're going to okay. go. I'll tell all you right. that's crazy, but this is an exclusive. I'm seeing this wonderful girl who wants to take me to uh, Bora Bora. She just came from Bora Bora. And she she came from the, the site where the bounty sunk. And she said, I want to take you to Bora Bora 
before life, our life is over. And I said, here, and I told my daughter, when I die, I want to get cremated. And my daughter, Renee, and my friend are going to take my ashes to Bora Bora and throw them in the water. They're the bounty. And I already put the money aside. Wow. Okay. Well, when are you, when are you going? Not to die. When are you going to Bora Bora well, to visit? I can't go until I'm dead. Okay. Right. Unless you want me to go before to check <laughs> out where they're going to throw the ashes. <laughs> I don't Great. think that's sorry. I can go to Puerto Rico and do that. By the way, Puerto Rico needs a lot of help. <laughs> okay. Well, listen, Vincent, I'm very honored that you came on to Guys Guys Radio. I'm so make a deal. Okay. Because I love talking to you. Thank Why don't you call me again a month from today? Okay. And we'll do another half an hour. I love it. You want to do that? And we'll talk about to... what's going on. Yeah. I'll All send right. you questions so, and topics so ahead of time. Good. Friends, right? Yes, absolutely, Vincent. All right. Now, where do you live? Because I want you to take me to dinner. I ain't doing this for nothing. All right. Well, listen, so I'm from New York, and yeah. I've been there for 35 years. I lived in uh, down the shore, uh, Ocean Grove, around Asbury Park. I lived up, oh, yeah? up in uh, yeah. 116th Street for the last nine years. But my family, my wife and my son, they wanted to get out of New York, so we moved to San Diego. So right now I'm in San Diego, and the show's on KCAA in L.A., but I'm going to be in New York in about five weeks from now, sometime in late February. How about I get in touch with you then? I'm happy to take you to dinner. Yeah, and then what you could do is maybe you could bring your little recorder or something. I don't yeah. know the technology, yeah. and we could do like an interview at a nice Italian restaurant in New York. That'd be awesome. All right. Okay. okay. All right. Is that a date? That's a date. Okay. All right. I really enjoyed uh, talking to you, but I'm a ball breaker. I know. It's fun, though. Thanks so much, Vincent. I really appreciate it. You're a guy's guy, so thank you. I'm a guy's guy. All right, we're back. Wow. What an interview. What an experience. What a great guy, Vincent Pastor. What an entertainer. He just really, he, he really did a number on me and on the show. It's fantastic. I think this is the most fun I've had in 398 Guys Guys Radio shows, and I'm so appreciative uh, of Vincent and his team for uh, his appearance on Guys Guys Radio. As we grow, hopefully we'll get more and more fantastic talents like Vincent on the show. So thank you, Vincent, again. And I hope, as you suggested, that we are friends, and I hope that we can do another show together. And what do you think of this? Vincent and the Guys Guy, maybe a new show, a separate show, who knows? But anyhow, what do I learn? What did I learn on the show? What did we learn? Well, we learned pretty much what I mentioned in the opening, that Vincent Pastor is a real renaissance man, and he can do it all. And he, he's got a band. He's a playwright. He's an actor on screen, on Broadway, TV, whether it be scripted or non-scripted. He's been in so many roles. He's constantly working, and he realizes it's a business. And the thing you want to do if you're an actor is get as many of your talents honed and sharpened and get out there and work. And I love the fact that he he brings something special to every single role he takes. And he's bringing something special to the new marinara sauce. Uh, it's fantastic. And just ask your local grocer. I know uh, the core of the product is now in uh, Long Island, but you can get it, I think, I, you can get it online. Anyhow, what else did I learn? Well, I think I also learned that, you know, I had uh, something to learn in dealing with a big personality like Vincent for an interview like this. He really uh, he really had some fun with me. And that's that's fine because ultimately, ultimately, I think he liked me and he let me know, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a ball buster. So uh, that's OK. That's fine. I can I totally dig it. And uh and I really had to, you know, I can do the same to people as any one of my friends or colleagues knows. But in this case, all respect for Vincent because uh, he's just, it was just being around the talent was so fantastic. So, Guys Guys Radio, your host, Robert Manny. Again, we're approaching our 400th show. It's just amazing. We're on KCAA Radio every Wednesday evening. We're on at 8 p.m. Pacific time. We're on 102.3 106.5 FM and 1050 AM. The show replays every Sunday at 2 PM. So you can hear it two different times on terrestrial radio. We're also all over the internet. The show is posted in a podcast version every Thursday morning following the show on Wednesday night. And it's on iHeart, 
Spotify, iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, Blog Talk Radio, CastBox. You can stream it on KCAA.com. You can stream it on my website, RobertManny.com. Now, the whole Guys Guys movement, if you will, uh, began with my novel called The Guys Guys Guide to Love. It's a novel. I also had the screenplay of it and a TV series uh, in development for it. And it's a lot of fun. And it's been called by Dan Wakefield, a very famous, iconic 20th century author, called it The Men's Successor to Sex in the City. And if you check out the book on Amazon, you'll see that we've got 28 out of 28 five-star ratings. And uh, that's a, that makes me feel really good when I read some of the reviews because people really enjoy it. And so that's a service, entertaining people. And they also say that there's a message to the book and it's a positive message, so that makes me feel great. So you might ask yourself, if you haven't listened to the show before and you tuned in because of Vincent, what the heck is a guy's guy? Well, a guy's guy is really uh, kind of a modern version of a man's man, but not macho, not chauvinistic, uh, more casual, casually confident uh, with an integrity. And integrity nowadays, it's in, it's in demand. And so integrity, real integrity can be seductive. Uh, guy's guy also has emotional intelligence, a uh, sense of humor, a respect for his fellow man, for women, for seniors, for kids, for animals, and for the planet. And he's also a person that men like hanging out with him, and women dig him also, and somebody with some charisma, some likability, and some passion, and a dream. And I think it's important that all guys have a dream. You know, nowadays, uh, very often guys get stuck, particularly boomers. Now, I'm at the tail end of the boomer generation, but I know a lot of my friends from way back from college and high school and just from my childhood, they're great guys. And I notice, and even talking to other people through the years, guys get stuck. They're not quite as open to change or as malleable to change as women are. And uh, that's why so many of my listeners are women, and it's it's fantastic. But I really want to reach guys. I really want to do a service for guys and put this information out there, whether it's about wellness, spirituality, uh, humor, uh, the law, finance, health, diet, whatever. There's so much information available to us, and there's so many experts. And I have had the the gift, really, of being able to interview uh, close to 400 experts in specific areas. So I've gotten this education from all these people. And it doesn't make me smarter than anybody by any means because I am, as anybody who knows me, I'm a real work in progress and I've got a lot of flaws and stuff. But you know what? I picked up a lot of information and I see the similarity in people who have really been successful, not just uh, monetarily, but successful in life, who really get it. They realize a number of things. And the biggest thing that I think they realize is that if you can recognize the divinity in every person or animal or thing you come in contact with, that we're all connected and we're all from the same source, if you can make that connection and see that all day, every day, your life will change and you're starting to get it if you really see that because you're going to see source or God or whatever you want to call it in everything. And you know what? I don't mean to be sanctimonious, whatever, but it's true. It makes a difference. It'll make a difference in the cells in your body. It'll make a difference in your health, your outlook, your happiness. And we're all challenged. Stuff happens all the time. We have to deal with stuff. I'm dealing with some stuff now, some lingering issues in New York, and I'm out here 3,000 miles away. You know what? I have to recognize the divinity in myself, in the situation. I have to be, look for the lesson and deal with it. And also you want to, you know, you want to forgive people. You don't have to forget, but you want to forgive and you want to show gratitude. All that stuff that sounds so rote, it's true, it's real, and you can do it. So that's what Guys Guys Radio is is really all about. You can check more out. I'm on my uh, my website's Robert Manny, M-A-N-N-I dot com. Also, you can find me on social media, you know, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, all of that. I'm everywhere. Guys Guys Radio is growing. We've got a fantastic audience. We've got so many great guests lined up. I am super appreciative uh, of Vincent Pastor's being on the show. It was so much fun. I learned so much from him. 
as a man and an entertainer. So I'm really thrilled, and I thank you for listening to Guys Guys Radio. We're going to be back next week with another guest, and we're just about at our 400th episode coming up, and uh, I'm so thrilled about that, and I'm so appreciative. So thanks for listening, and as I always like to say, Guys Guys, finish first. Guys Guy Radio.